Brecken, can you hear me there? Everything good on the live stream? Looks good here. Just want to make sure before I start talking a whole lot. You guys want to have your notebooks ready? And Jose, I would turn the computer on just so it's on. Because for next week, we're going to make revisions to the Plinko game based on our feedback, trying to tune the difficulty of it. So if you're behind on that, you've got to get caught up so that you can get feedback so that you can actually tune the game. Wednesday, we'll look at your revisions on the playground. Those look pretty good, the ones I saw coming in on Slack. Um, we'll probably do some revisions on those. I think we'll look at those on Wednesday. But today, I wanted to just get the new project going. And, okay, everybody can hear me. Let's talk about the new project here. Let's do this. Okay. Um, yeah, Plinko, very simple game. We're increasing the complexity here a little bit. And when we increase the complexity of the game design, your attention to detail working on the game needs to be increased as well in order to make sure everything stays functional. I've got a starting point for everybody to work with on this game. And in previous semesters when we did this project, for a while I was doing it as a Pong game as we were working through the history of uh, interactive design and video games. Uh, the problem with doing a Pong game in a class like this is that uh, Pong, for those of you who aren't familiar, is essentially one of the you know first um, yeah, one of the first arcade games. I have uh, a video for you to watch there. So those of you who aren't, anything that's blue on an assignment is something that you should be clicking on. You should not be thinking of it as optional. That's the wrong strategy to have in this class. So every time I've linked to something, it's something I want you to check out, I want you to take notes on, and I want you to integrate into your thinking while working on the assignment. And so I've got this really great um, Smithsonian um, video, actually, about Pong um, and the development of Pong and the first Pong games. But uh, Pong uh, is you know, essentially super simplified um, uh, tennis you know, on, the, well, on a video game. And so it's, a, it's sort of an innately two-player game. I need to sign up for YouTube Premium on my school account. I, I, if you don't have YouTube um, Pro or whatever they call it, just what they call it, YouTube Premium? Yeah, because it's, what, what is it, like five bucks? It's like not that expensive, but um, not, not to advertise for them, but the, it just doesn't show you any more ads, which is, uh, what's that? And then it, it blocks the YouTube ads? Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. Good tip. So download an app blocker. I'll try that. What's that? Okay, ad blocker plus. That's what Jose recommends. Um, right, so you're bouncing a ball back and forth between two paddles. A lot of you guys have seen Pong before. Watch the background on Pong. I'm not going to play all the background videos here in class, just in an effort to not get this video taken down off of YouTube. And then uh, the, this is you know, one of the first games here. Now that looking at this, there should be some wheels turning for you as far as like, oh yeah, I kind of have an idea of how something like this would be achieved in Unity now. Um, but for people working on the games individually, it makes more sense for us to work on the next iteration of Pong which was you know, one player Pong, commonly known as uh, Breakout, right? So where you're uh, moving the paddle and there's bricks and you're, um, let's see here, and breaking the bricks slowly over the course of trying to clear out all the bricks 
on the level. And so um, the, you know, this is breakout, I think is the first name. I, you know, in my personal history, I probably first came across this as Arkanoid, which was, you know, one of the popular arcade iterations of this game. Um, but uh, I have some background about this here, the history of Breakout, which is also incredibly interesting and involves uh, Steve Wozniak. You guys know who Steve Wozniak is? So Steve Wozniak is, um, you know, the brains behind the very first Apple computers. Jobs is the guy with the ideas and the marketing, Steve Jobs. But Steve Wozniak is, you know, historically a super important Silicon Valley engineer character and um, is involved in coding a lot of the original Breakout. You know, all of these original video games, uh, you know, you needed to be a, a, an engineer to sort of get this stuff done. There was no Unity, there was no Unreal Engine. You're sort of writing the stuff right on the hardware using something close to, you know, machine code it was m much more arduous. <laughs> um, uh, and then I have another video here, uh, two of them, talking about breakout um, some different variants, which is important to check out here. I'm gonna see if I can install the ad blocker. In the instance of thinking about how you can introduce variation into your level, because one of the main part for this first week is that your breakout, we're gonna make one level, okay? One breakout level, but yours needs to have a theme of some kind, um, some sort of visual theme to tie the whole thing together. And we'll look at some different approaches here. But, you know, watch, take notes on all of this stuff. Anytime I link to anything in blue, it's a sign that you should be considering it and absorbing it in your design process. Um, the, as such, um, this project is a little bit more complex and I've um, stored an entire project on GitHub. What is GitHub? GitHub is um, online code repository. So, um, you know, it's by far the most widely used place for people to share code online, right? And you can make it private or public or whatever. And um, in addition to that, the primary thing that GitHub is doing for people that we're, all you're, we're gonna use GitHub for is for me to give you the project, okay? Uh, I, I store the things on GitHub because it allows for something that you should know about and you should write down version control, right? So you've probably run into this just accidentally doing the bit of game design we've done over the past month, month and a half. Uh, version control allows you to uh, save every change, right? Because we've all done this now at this point where you um, made a change and it wasn't for the better and you wish you could go back and you may have saved over the previous one. This happens a lot when you're writing code, um, if you're in there actually authoring all the scripts, where you know you take a you make a choice on the design tree, and it turns out it was the wrong path you have chosen unwisely, and now you need to step back, like okay, I need to go, I need to rewind the clock to three days ago before I made this stupid decision, and and redo it. And so version control allows you to do that. Essentially, uh, GitHub, which is online, interfaces with Unity, and every time you save it or uh, yeah, push it to GitHub, then it stores that version of it, and then at any point in the future, you can go back to past versions of it. But we're not gonna get involved in the idiosyncrasies of all this. What you guys need to know is that you know, I, when I give you these template projects, I'm storing them on GitHub now. And so you need to know how to get onto GitHub and pull down the code so that you can use it as your starting template. So again, there is a starting template for this project. I think, yeah, almost all the projects we do from this point forward in the semester 
I'll be handing you off a project to start with. So you will not be making a new project, right? The idea is that I, I've set a bunch of things up here, and you need to um, download that project because it's got a bunch of things already set up as your you know, starting point so that we don't get stuck in you know, 45 minutes of configuration before you can actually do anything creative. Um, cool, so let's look at how that works. It's not super complicated for what you need to do. In fact, no, you don't even need to sign up, right. Um, and so the link here uh, goes to the GitHub repository and uh, right here under code, you can right click and say download zip. And this will give you a zip file of the entire project. And I'll do that. Let's see. I changed my downloads folder now, so it goes to D drive. Should be in here. There it goes. And this shouldn't be, I don't think this is a very big file. It's really just uh, the template to start off with. Nothing. There you go. And let's unzip. So you'll need to unzip this. And the good news is Unity was updated on the school computers over the weekend. So now, let's see. Here. OK, so you've downloaded it. Now you need to open it. You want to open it from the hub. And so we need to add it to the projects that we're using. And so I can go to open. I need to move it before I do that into the folder I'm going to keep it in out of the downloads folder. So let's grab the folder here and dump it into my art 200 folder. Remember, when you're moving a Unity project, you need to move the whole folder. Everybody is clear on this now, right? It's not just one file. It's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and now, this is also confusing for people at the beginning, is that when you open a new project here, where do you need to open? One level above assets, OK? That's the folder that Unity recognizes as the project folder, OK? It's important to realize in this case, because the way this unzipped, there's actually two folders here, right? So here we go, click on this one. GitHub makes this extra top folder. Now, this one at the very top here, Unity Breakout, Unity Main. Click on that. Breakout, Unity Main. OK, here's the Assets folder. And so this is the one I need to point Unity at. And so I'll go to Open, and I'll go to 200, and double click. And then this one, which is one level above the Assets folder, I can double click by double check by clicking on it. All right, yeah, there's the Assets folder. Uh, you may notice that this one doesn't have a bunch of the other stuff yet. Uh, it's because that other stuff is generated by Unity when you open it on your computer. And you don't need to store it on GitHub. And so that just makes the download smaller. And so there we go. We say open. And OK, we get this. The, I was developing this on my computer with 2021.3.4.f1. 20, Remember, the, most, the numbers further to the left are the more important numbers in the version number. Okay, And so 2021, that's by far the most important one. right? Migrating your project to 2022 or migrating back to 2020 would be a big change, where 
things would most likely break and it would be a total headache. The next number only goes one, two, three, okay? And so 2021 three, right? Um, we're, we have a version of 2021 three, it's just that the last numbers were a little bit different. The last numbers are the, you know, the incremental changes that they keep making to 2021-3, mostly small bug fixes, no gigantic feature changes, things like that. And so if you're, if unless you have the exact same version, it'll prompt this. And so now, okay, well, let me choose the version I have. And in this case, based on the information you see here, right, look at the information here. It says that this was made with 20, 21, 3, 4, F1. What would be the best version to open it with on my computer? The top one or the bottom one? The top one. Why? Because it's 20, 21, 3, right? That's, and then the last bit of junk is a little bit different. The other one is 20, 21, 1. That's much further away in terms of a version number. Everybody with me? Okay. So I'll say this one and open. And then you'll say change editor version. Yes. Um, th this happens a couple of times on Slack. The, when you get a pop-up window, it's not always an error. It's not always a sign that something's going wrong. It's just the, com the computer trying to communicate with you. And so read the messages so that you can, most of the time you can make a, you should know enough now to make a pretty solid decision about what's going on. So let's say change version. And this will probably take a minute. Let's see how it's going. And then you'll get this. Once again, it's warning you, right? It says this does not match the other one. But we're making the decision that I think we're going to be OK because it's almost exactly the same, just a slightly different one. OK? So we're going to again say continue. And we'll let that. The first time you open it, uh, it may take a little bit longer because Unity has to generate you know, the library files and a bunch of other stuff. And we'll let it chew on that stuff for a little bit here. And We'll pivot while that's happening. So this is going to be a 2D project, right? So we'll be in a 2D world, much like you see in Breakout. And let's, this will get loaded here in a second. Let's talk about our design decisions here. Because I get the feeling a lot of students' attitude in this class at this point to just sort of get through the Unity, right? The Unity is the, the tool we're using to actually do some interactive design, right? And your primary co concern should be your design thinking. Um, the tools will change. The tools change all the time. I learn new tools constantly. You'll, if you want to do this for real, you'll need to learn new tools all the time. It's your underlying thinking that will separate you from other people doing this job. There's a lot of people who can learn the buttons to click on, but it's not about knowing which buttons to click on. I mean, there's some of that you need to, a, a hurdle you need to clear. But it's about knowing what you want to do here. And in this case, let's look at some of the breakout variants here and look at some of the things that's going on with the game and start thinking about the general design decisions in the game here. Right after this HBO Max ad. We'll come right back. You guys watching House of the Dragon? You guys watch Game of Thrones? No. There's George. Can I skip this? There we go. 
All right, cool. So uh, this is just sort of like a compilation of some different breakout versions. And they're kind of, I think this one is organized relatively chronologically. Um, and so here we see, you know, sort of the earlier ones. And I think there's some chronological progression here. So we'll see the graphics get less crude as this goes on. Um, and you see people are sort of working with the tools here. But this one's set up in a like sort of sideways um, configuration. And as you're thinking about this game here, what are the different parameters, right? And a parameter that's going to influence the game design isn't necessarily even going to be something that ends up being like a slider in Unity, right? There's other, what I like to call meta parameters that you can adjust that are sort of things above that level that would uh, change the difficulty and playability of the game. But let's just come up with a list of things here off the top of our head. What is going to make Breakout more or less difficult? What's one thing that could be changed in the basic Breakout setup? OK, yeah, just the just ball speed, right? This is something that's going to, uh, this is a something, all the things we're going to list here are things that you need to make a decision about, right? Don't take the defaults. As you do work in this space, in order to get the programs to function, they need to have some sort of starting values, right, in order to like work. This is not the case in painting class, right? You've got a blank canvas. It's totally blank, and you can manifest everything from nothingness there. Design in the computer is not the same way in general, right? In order to get the tools to function, they need to have some sort of starting parameters. And my message to you is don't take the defaults, okay? Think about what the settings are here and how you want to adjust them for your game design. So yeah, ball speed is a big one. And that'll literally be a, a number in a script, right? In Unity, once this loads here, that we'll be able to um, adjust so that uh, we can make the game more difficult or less difficult. Some other added level later on would be like maybe we increase the ball speed over the course of the level, right? That would allow for increased difficulty, right? But the goal here is not to make the game um, as difficult as possible, right? The goal here is to make it a rewarding experience. You have to balance the difficulty with the reward. If the game is too easy, it's boring. If the game is too difficult, it's frustrating. You've got to try and find that middle in a well, visually well-designed game that'll make it uh, make people want to continue to play it. So what's another thing that would adjust the difficulty of the game or the playability of the game? Rin, what do you think? OK, well, what, what is the goal here? OK. So, you, so the ball would make impact and like make a new block? Yeah. So that type of like total open world game design thinking isn't on the plate, isn't on the plate for us for this semester, right? You guys, I, I sort of introduce uh, code level design. And so you need to work within the limitations, right? Um, we're not going to, you know, uh, do that sort of thing. So the, because this is an art class, right? This is ART 200. It's not CIS uh, 105 or even CIS 205 or whatever. Um, and so what, what about the bricks in particular, right? Keeping within the overall game design of the original breakout, what about the bricks makes it more or less difficult? 
Okay, how easily they break. And Rin, what, what's coming back to you? What's another thing about the bricks that makes it more or less difficult? What's another thing about the bricks? Okay, that's a good one. I hadn't thought about that. Brick, brick size, right? Uh, in a lot of these early games, because of the limitations, we'll see that all the bricks are exactly the same size, right? But having some different size bricks, um, that's on the table for us, right? That's a parameter we can easily change. Um, brick size, and we're missing a big one here. What if the level had one brick? Well, this is something that we could adjust, right? Number of bricks. This is another big one here, right? Um, for the Plinko game, we I had everybody give feedback based on your win-loss percentage. And on this one, the thing we're going to be aiming for is uh, play time, right? How long does it take you to play one this one level? And so we're going to say maybe two minutes or something like that um, as our starting point here. And so the number of bricks would drastically influence that, right? Because you get a limited number of lives. You can't have the ball go past the paddle. And so number of bricks would be one. Jose, what's another thing you could change? in the game to adjust the difficulty. Sure. OK, that's a good one. Not Grix. Grix. You guys are the only people here. Or let's look in the chat. You guys got to get in here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Brecken says changes to the visuals of the blocks as the hit points go down. Yeah. So they could, as a way to communicate the state of what's going on. We did most of that through our UI in the first game, as far as like letting our player know, like, you won, you lost, so on and so forth. Um, OK, that's a good starting point. How about in terms of the paddle? Rin, what's something that would make What's something you could change on the paddle that would make the game more or less difficult? Yeah. So paddle size. Diana, what's another thing about the paddle? Paddle number. Interesting. Yeah. Because we have the one paddle that we control, but how do you make something move with something else without writing any code? I have this thing moving, and I have another thing. I want it to move exactly with this thing. It's the same in every program. In our swings, how did we get the swing seat to also swing with the swing ropes? We didn't animate both of them. We just animated one thing. Brecken's got it. Parent, child, right? If you have one thing you want to move with the other thing, you just make it a child of the thing. Everyone, write that down on a big page. That's a 
Everyone here has taken 184. That's one you really want to have as part of your, you know, library of knowledge right at the fingertips, right? If you have something that's moving and you want something else to move with it, you make it a child of the thing, right? Uh, so that would be one way to do that paddle number, to have one move from one to the other. Um, and Brecken said paddle shape. would affect it. Paddle size, paddle number, paddle shape. There's another big another one here that pops out at me that we're missing. Paddle The way it's set up right now is that we're going to use the left and right keys to move the paddle. Paddle speed. Yes, very good. I say paddle speed, right? That's another Another big one, making decisions about all of these things, right? Not all of them are sliders on a script, right? Size, number, these things are, would be, you would implement in some other um, way. Yeah, Nick also got speed there in his. Uh, shape is not going to be a slider. Speed will be a slider, right, with something that we can use to just dial up and down how fast you're able to move in the paddle. Let's look at some more here. This is super breakout. So here we start to see things get themed a little bit, right? These things are pretty interesting. They you know, move up as a way to break bricks once you make contact with them. Um, and th I want to draw your attention to this. right? So in the past when we've done this assignment, <coughs> there's been uh, the relatively simple shape of the things you're making contact with is that you know, we're going to refer to them as bricks throughout the just discussion of the game. But they don't have to be shaped like bricks, right? They could be circles or you know, rectangles. Bricks are rectangles. They could be triangles, right? The, that kind of decision, right? Would, um, which of those shapes would be the easiest shape? Yeah, why? It's much, yeah, it's much easier to predict the angle of the ball coming off of the brick than it would be certainly off of a circle and then also off of a triangle, right? It's just, I mean, it's still coming off at a opposite angle. But uh, this would be another thing. Here, a lot of students in the past, their initial design decision was like, I'm going to turn every brick into a bug, right? And then you have to hit all of the bugs. And I'm not sure that works super well for this game design in that we have a limited amount of space here. This is uh, a different, you know, sort of a, one of the limitations here of our game design is that everything is on the screen. We're just in this one space, right? So in a lot of contemporary games, like, you're able to move the space is much bigger than what we're seeing on screen. But here, we're limited to what we see on screen. And I would encourage you to think about this, arranging things to form an image as part of your theme versus making every individual part themed. This seems much more interesting to me. And as we just talked about the shapes that would adjust difficulty here, um, we decided rectangle would be the easiest, right? And then triangle and square would be more difficult. And so if you were just setting up your, setting up your level just like this here, with uh, you know, primarily bricks, layers of, of bricks going up, how, what's one way you could have the difficulty increase as the, as the level goes on? Just changing shape, right? If it was set up like this, how could you set up your shapes 
so that the difficulty would increase as the level went on. Yeah, yeah. So at the bottom here, we could have regular looking bricks where the ball ricochet would be f more predictable, right? And then maybe here, it's regular bricks. And then here, you know, it's some bricks maybe at some stranger angles, right? Because it's going to be more difficult. And maybe they, some of them are also smaller, right? The smaller is usually going to be more difficult than larger because it's, uh, we do, we'll have some control over the, um, s the angle, but um, not complete. And then we could start to introduce more difficulty by introducing other shapes. Up here, we have some triangles, right? And so now, because of the way the game is set up, the player needs to destroy these first before it gets to those. And so just by function of setting up the level in this sort of progressive way, we end up with this uh, increased difficulty. And up here, we could do some smaller circles, right? That could be something that would increase difficulty as, as it went on. Here's laughing at us. So here's Arkanoid. Spent a good amount of time in Pizza Hut doing this 30 years ago. Um, and Nick and Brecken were talking about the bricks changing color based on how many times you have to hit them, right? So the number of hit points each one gets. Here we see some power ups that are happening as a result of hitting certain bricks. And so the power ups, this is a classic sort of risk reward situation, right? Where the power ups would, uh, they do different things to make your paddle faster or your paddle bigger, something like that. Uh, however, to try and grab the power up while the ball's bouncing around, you have to risk that in order to get to the power up, right? Because uh, it makes it harder to get around to those two things. This is the first level of Arkanoid. Let's see here. Here's something a little more modern. And so here, we really start to get into a situation where now this game is having a little bit of a theme beyond just the paddle and the bricks, right? Uh, you know, as with most video games, the theme is space, or as with many video games, right? Uh, in that we get this like space, it's very lightly, lightly themed, right? We get this like techno looking border here, and then we get the background. And so let me call your attention to this, the background, right? This is an opportunity to do something that really aligns with whatever the visual theme is that you choose for your game, uh, to really enrich the visual environment uh, in a way that's interesting, but not so interesting that it takes away from the where the player's eye needs to be, right? Which is the actual gameplay elements. And so here they've done this by using the space background that is less busy and uh, also less color. There's way more color in all the bricks. This is kind of monochromatic. This is something that you've seen in a million video games, right? is that the background is less saturated. It's one of the primary ways in video games that they communicate what is background, you know, visual enrichment, and what is a playable element. Write this down. Put a huge exclamation part around it. Not just for this game, for every game we make from this point. This is one of your primary one of your primary jobs as a game designer is that inevitably the game will have things that you can interact with and things you can't interact with. And you need to come up with a consistent way to communicate that to the player. And here, one of the ways it's primary one of the ways it's typically done in you know 2D games like this is that the background is less saturated and the foreground is more saturated. And we've kind of just absorbed that now 
as being one of the key hints in visual design. Just thinking about games you've played in the past, how have other games you've played addressed this issue, right? How do you know what is background and what is, what is playable? Can you guys think of any examples from other games you've played? A lot more complicated. Okay, so uh, like in a 3D instance, that would be sort of some of the material settings, right? Where maybe things you interact with are shiny, right? And things that you don't interact with are dull would be like a super simplified version of that, right? Something like that. What other what other ways? Brecken says Mario and Tetris. Yes, those games do that uh, through the background. Right, we'll look at a Tetris example here. What's another way? Well, how about games like point and click games? How do they let you know what you can click on and what you can't? Jose, I'm a for, you know, I'm a drummer, so like I've definitely lost an uncomfortable amount of my hearing at this point. So what was the one more thing? What was it? Yeah, point and click games. What about it? Like how do they let you know what you can click on? Maybe not even a game, like in an application. Okay. But how, how do you know what you can click on and what you can't? Nick on the chat says dialog boxes. Yeah, you could have a dialog box. That seems a little inelegant, right? As far as like, click on this. What would be a way that was less visually obtrusive to tell you what you could click on? Anybody played any real-time strategy games? Your StarCrafts, your Command and Conquers, League of Legends? Anybody a professional League of Legends player? Why not? Seems like you make a ton of money doing that. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could outline. It could um, change color. It could highlight, right? All these things could change when you put the mouse over top of something, right? As a way to, uh, Brecken says graying out. Nick says outline. Yeah, outline is a big one, right? So this, in this game here, we, we don't need to worry about mousing over things. But we do want to create a background that enriches the gameplay experience to the point where it looks visually polished, but doesn't distract from what's going on. And so desaturating the background or making the background, what, what's another way, those of you who have taken photography class, when you take a portrait, for instance, with a camera, you, you, you use a, a shallow depth of field. And so in that case, what are you doing to the background to draw attention to the foreground? Desaturate was the one we were just talking about, but the one I'm talking about right now. You guys taking photography class yet? You did? Okay, who'd you take it with? Okay, but who was the teacher? Nick! Nick's got it, blur, right? What if the background was slightly blurred? That would also draw a lot of attention to the foreground. Cheers to you, Nick, nailed it. Uh, I don't think I've ever played this version, Quester. Here's a, another emergent gameplay property, right? 
where um, another thing to keep in mind here is that uh, what's another meta property? Every time you try to hit the ball, you can hit it or miss it, right? And so is the game more difficult with more hits or less hits? Less is theoretically easier, right? If you only had to hit the ball once, versus like if I said, okay, Jose, you've got to hit it 100 times, no misses. Or you have to hit it once, no misses. You're going to take once, right? Because it's just once. Um, so here, when bricks are arranged like this, where there's a hole, and you can get the ball up there and have it bounce around and do a lot of damage without you know, this is, if you played a lot of these games, this is uh, one of your gameplay strategies. Even if the level isn't set up like this, you could just focus, try to focus the ball on one side to create a hole to get it up there. Because if the ball is bouncing around a whole bunch and you don't need to be worrying about catching it every time or bouncing off of it every time, that makes the game easier. So thinking about that in your brick arrangements for everybody. And here's another collection of breakout. Ugh, OK. We'll wait for that to be over. I wonder if I can install an ad blocker on the school computer. I will try after this class. Yeah, I mean, it's not, not a bad idea. All right. Like, how many Pizza Hut commercials do I need to see? Um, right, so here we have some other variations. Um, bricks on, something interesting here, bricks on the side, right? So the orientation of the bricks might be interesting. Let's see here. Here's a total 3D implementation. where the bricks are in piles. You need to sort of get the piles. Yeah, but this one has a really interesting thing up here. The bricks are moving. This is another meta property, meta difficulty, right? A moving brick is definitely going to be harder to hit than a stationary brick. And so thinking about this, they've considered it in the level design. The ones here in the beginning, stationary. Once you clear those out, then you've got to hit the moving bricks, right? So sequencing, like the vert, because of the way the game is oriented, the verticality of it is one of the primary things we can use to sequence the difficulty, right? We're only going to make one level here for this. Um, and so, but we want to have level stages of difficulty within that level. And so this game designer managed to accomplish that in that there's these parts here that are stationary that you need to plow through before you get to the moving bricks up top, which are going to be more difficult, right? So it allows the, this one level to have a few stages of difficulty. Some of these other ones here. Here's an interesting one with you got multiple brick sizes in there. And from a visual standpoint here, what's another cool addition that we haven't really seen up until this point? What happens every time you hit a brick? Yeah, we get an explosion animation happening there, right? That does a lot to visually enrich. And again, a lot of the, this one looks magically themed. And so where is the theming happen, happening? Uh, we see that the gameplay elements are still, they're a little bit stylized, but they're still primarily bricks, right? Um, I think this is a solid strategy in put the theming into like this really you know, interestingly designed magic-ish looking border here, right? Kind of makes it look like it's in a dungeon or something. And the background, again, let me draw your attention to this low contrast in the background. Why is that a good thing, to have the low contrast background?
Okay, well, contrast just has to do with like the distance between the brightness and the darkness. So you could have all bright, and it would be very low contrast, or you could have all dark, and it would be very low contrast. But why, why do we want, I'm telling you, we want low contrast for the background, why? Yeah, that's right, right. We want, the, what, what does the player need to keep their eye on? The ball, right? The ball probably being the, the most important thing. And then next, the bricks and the pattern, right? Those two things. And so in those instances, you want to make sure that those elements, the gameplay elements, by far are the most um, easy to see that you're not struggling to see the gameplay elements against a background. You want your background to have some sort of pattern to enrich, but not so much that it distracts from the gameplay, right? And so we've got the blue ball here. This game, this game design here, um, they're using color in a, in a pretty competent way here in that uh, the ball, which is of the utmost importance, is the only thing with this you know, very saturated blue color, right? Except for this one brick up here. I bet this brick probably does this, maybe a one-up brick or some other sort of power-up, right? How can we tell? Because you know, the color matches the color here. We're communicating. It doesn't need to have a sign on it that says you know, one-up. We're doing it just through the color design there. Super interesting. We get the bricks that have an animation that plays before they are destroyed. So there's like a damage animation. And here we have these moving destructibles where they take, again, Instead of making each thing a seahorse, they took the bricks and arranged them in the seahorse design. I think that is a better strategy for this type of game. A lot of students want to, like, I'm going to make them all ice cream cones. I think a better strategy would be a destructible ice cream cone, right, made out of whatever the fundamental component is that you're using in your game. But this is new in that they, those destructible things are moving around here. Different orientation here. We're getting a lot of effects happening here when it makes contact with the bricks, when it makes contact with the paddle. The paddle has an idle animation, right? It seems like the, the thing down here does some sort of uh, engine animation. We're going to talk about particles on Wednesday and about adding them to the game. We get a lot of collectibles happening here for our score. And we get animated background. Cool. Does a lot to sort of enrich the space sci-fi nature of what's going on here. But notice again, it is animated. Once you have an animated background, uh, we have an additional thing where we just talked about it, right? Desaturation is a way to keep the focus on the gameplay elements. And that's happening here, right? And also low contrast. Blurring would be another possible technique to use to keep the attention on the foreground stuff. Um, but now that we have an animated background, what is the analogous 
parameter for animation, for background animation? Like, what is the general quality about the speed of the animation in the background that's going to keep it from drawing your attention? How would you want the speed of the background animation to look? Let's watch this one. Yes, exactly, right? When you're talking about drawing attention, in general, we're going to watch fast. Your eye is drawn to fast moving things. There's all sorts of possible evolutionary explanations for that, right? You're hunting squirrels in the woods. Squirrel moves really quick. You, you want that to catch your attention so you can eat the squirrel, right? Millions of years ago as a early human subsisting on squirrels. But um, and now we live in a world where you know, that's just our reality. Like we look at the things moving, right? Also, in danger, right? The tiger's coming at you fast. Y your attention needs to be on the tiger. Um, and so uh, the background, if it's going to be animated, should be slow, right? That's the analogous thing here. Uh, and it does a lot to sort of like enrich the environment. It's so like this cool, you know, ribbon-ish kind of things happening back there. But it's not happening so fast that it's drawing your attention away from uh, what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, the, so here's um in this one, you know, there's a lot of 3D bells and whistles going on here. But let's just look at the fundamental gameplay elements here. We've got these things that are a little bit easier at the end. We've got these guys that look like they may be indestructible or may have to take a whole bunch of hits to get rid of that are animated here at the top. And this is another primary thing that you can adjust for difficulty. Is it d difficult, is it easier or harder when something is very close to the paddle? Yeah, why? Yeah, way faster, right? You guys watch tennis, the work at the net You've got to react instantly, right? I mean, the, the level they play tennis on TV is, you know, you got the work when you do away from the net is also super difficult. But you just have less reaction time, right? And so by putting some sort of very big um, bumper right here at the very beginning, um, that would increase difficulty quite a bit, right? In that you're going to have less time to react to the ball bouncing off of those things. If you're just trying to hit things over here, it takes a long time for the ball to get there, and when the ball ricochets off, you've got quite a ways, uh, much more time than you would when it's closer, to adjust and hit the ball. All sorts of visual things happening here. OK, so check all of those out. Uh, close the whole window. Let's. OK, and then, um, like I said, they're updating Unity all the time. When you get this editor check, OK, you don't need to, you don't need to do this, OK? I just, unless you hear from me that there's some sort of particular bug that we've run into, right? Is this, look, look at what it's asking me to do here. Is this going to be a big change in the editor? How, why did you change your answer? OK, I mean, that's the correct thing to do, but why are you doing it? 
Uh, well, in this case, probably not, right? Because this is, is this a big change or a small change? This is the version that we're on. This is the version it's asking us to upgrade to. Would you say this is big or small? Small, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This number's the same, 2021. That's the most important one. Three, that number's the same too, right? And so the only thing that's changed is whatever changed between 10 F1 and 11 F1. Super minor, super minor. So Jose, these kind of changes, like when the first two numbers are the same, this, the interface is not gonna change at all, right? Like the, a big interface change would happen between like 2021 and 2022 or usually not even that. It would be like several years that they would make a massive change to it. Um, so we would just say skip, right? Unless you hear from me that like something we're doing, you know, doesn't work in whatever version or something like that. Um, awesome, all right, this finally opened. It took a while on the school computer, but it, should, it would, uh, shouldn't take quite as long on your computer at home. All right, so we've talked a lot about the game design. Game design decisions, okay? That you think, the things you need to be thinking about above and beyond the actual implementation of that here in Unity, right? And so I can't stress this enough. Think away from the computer. You know how many good ideas I have at the computer? None, okay? They all happen other places. For me, it's always um, walking or running. Like, you're a physical machine. The, the, all of the circuitry runs in a much better way when uh, you know, the blood is moving a little bit. So, all of this game design stuff, you need to be thinking about before you open Unity, right? Thinking about, okay, what do I want to actually do here? What's going to make this interesting? Because once you get into the computer, this tool still provides a reasonable amount of resistance, and a lot of your attention is going to be uh, sucked up into implementing your ideas. That's going to take like 100% of your energy, leaving 0% for idea generation, or I like this word, ideation, right? The process of coming up with ideas. And so you need to do free your mind away from the computer to work on your ideas and then implement them at the computer, right? Um, yeah, I can't stress that enough. So uh, let's talk about the template. Where do we get the template? Where is the place where you're going to get the template? GitHub, GitHub. yeah, G-I-T-H-U-B. But there's a link to it on the assignment, right? Just all you have to do is press the link, right? Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's talk about this template and how it's set up. And so we get to here and there's nothing here. Why not? Because we haven't loaded the scene, okay? So you need to open the scene. There's several scenes here, and you need to open the scene. Um, something I believe we talked about once, but down here in the asset window, we have this search by type button. This is super handy, especially when you get a new project, right? Uh, I pull things down off of GitHub all the time that other people did in Unity, and I don't know exactly how they're setting up their projects, the first thing I do is come over here and I say, just show me the scenes. Because then I can, inevitably the work they did is in some scene. And now it shows me all of the scenes in the project. And I can be like, oh, okay, this is that example, this is that example, this is that example. And then go from there. And so this, this thing over here, you can check the things that you want to see. This is also useful in lots of other contexts, right? If I just like, all right, let me just see all the materials. Ideally, you should be keeping all of your materials in a folder labeled materials, but it happens. Like sometimes they end up in a different folder, and this would allow you to see all of the materials in the project no matter where they are in the folder hierarchy. 
cool back here. And so I labeled these. I duplicated the scene uh, and tried to name them as clearly as possible. Breakout template. Do not change. Okay. So this one is here for your reference. It's set up and it's working. This one is the one where you want to start your work. Okay, you want to open that one and start doing your thing there. Why separate them out like this? So that this one is still here. If something goes wrong in your game, you can go back to the working scene and be like, okay, I think, uh, let, let me see how this, maybe, maybe I checked a box or something got messed up and I can, I'm not really sure what scripts Casey had on the ball. Let me go ahead and check on the template. And that's why I have that there. Everybody with me? Okay, so that's why there's two scenes here and we'll open the template here first. And here we go. So this is the template and I've got a couple things here. And we're in 2D, and I've set up some things in the scene. One, up here in the scene view, it's labeled as 2D, and that's probably how you're gonna to wanna to look at most of the time. But remember, everything in Unity is 3D, even when it's not, okay? That everything still has some sort of Z depth. We still have a camera, the camera is some distance from our stuff, so on and so forth. And so occasionally, especially as you're designing the game, it may be necessary to get out of 2D view and just look here. What are you looking for? What happens a lot of times with students is that um, they don't realize that the object has somehow been misplaced on the z-axis. And if I were to move this one like way back here and come back here, in this view, it looks fine. Right? It seems like my ball should be able to hit this thing. But in, in three-dimensional view, we see that it is really misplaced. Why is this the case? Why doesn't it look smaller? Because it is in the distance. It, this is the case in this game. Where is my mouse? Uh-oh. Please don't crash. Here we go, I'm back, all right. Um, we've used Cinema 4D. Objects in the distance do not look smaller. What is the name for that type of view? Starts with an O. This is like a close. This is like the pop up on Wheel of Fortune. I'm going to keep typing letters until someone. There we go. Orthographic, right? The, that 2D button up there throws the scene view into an orthographic mode so that objects in the background do not get smaller. This button right here. And so here, the only way that you would know that this thing is displaced is by looking over here at the coordinates. What all of the things that are functional in our game should be at z equals 0 in, you know, flat 2D games this game qualifies in this design, right? This isn't a rule for the rest of the semester going forward. This is a rule for this game, is that all the stuff we want to run into each other 
needs to be at z equals zero. But this is a common problem that somehow things get displaced, and so you need to come over here and get them back to z equals zero. So that now, if I looked at it, ah, yes, that looks correct. Everybody with me there? So this is a big thing to understand that you can toggle between these things in order to see what's happening in the game, right? Because uh, that's a big one in our 2D game design here. Uh, let's make sure everything's functioning. I think it is. It's the first time we hit play, so it's going to take a second. And it takes a second, then the ball launches. And here I can hit the ball. There we go. Cleared them all, first time. I'm not good. Um, cool. We see how things are working here. It comes uh, to a stop when the all the bricks are cleared or when um, uh, the last ball hits the uh, kill zone. Okay, So this zone here, past, I'll miss the ball this time, past the ball is a collider that tells the game that you've you failed. You've missed, you missed the ball. It has gone past the thing. Here, I've got one that's sort of misplaced here. We don't want this bottom wall on. It was a, it was ricocheting off the ball. It wasn't allowing us to hit. All right, and so it stops, and then it resets. Gives you another chance. Stops and resets. Game over. All right. Let's look at the structure of everything. I've tried to organize things over here. So we've got this, the different walls, right? And so the ball is bouncing off of those. And each wall, if we look, it has some sort of sprite, some sort of collider, and a rigid body. The things I would keep in mind here is that the rigid body is set to static, right? Because it's not going to be something that moves, the boundaries of the game. This is another meta parameter. How big is the play area, right? So you want to, we want to set this. I don't think, because I set this, this doesn't go with the settings. We're again going to be putting it and publishing it. And so we want to make sure that this stays 16 by 9 over here. But you see that I made the walls and I moved them in here so that I would have more of a vertical play area. This is another choice that you can make. You could open up the play area by moving these uh, sidewalls uh, left and right. How do you think this is going to affect the game? Yeah, it, it's, it's just moving the walls by itself is not necessarily going to make it harder or easier. There's some other factors that would come in here. There's not sort of a direct correlation. But there is the fact that you would, by moving the walls further out, what is one of the other parameters that you probably would need to really think about? There's more space now. And so how would that affect the paddle? If it can go that far, and then also the speed of the paddle becomes even more critical at this point, right? Because you've got to cover more ground. So that's going to be a major thing to um, take care of. So let's look at the basic setup here. Now again, I'm going to walk you through the basic setup. 
most of this, all of this is already done in your starting template, okay? And so those things are there. Again, your work here is not to make another new scene and rebuild the game. Your work is to open the, start your work and start transforming that into your version of the game. Everybody with me there? Yeah? Okay. Um, so let's go, let's look at the main things here first. Uh, the ball, we'll, we'll start with the player. The player has got the rigid body on it and the polygon collider and the player limits script, okay? So the important things here is that you're gonna need a new sprite for your design of the player, right? And that is gonna go here, right? What, it's gonna be your design for the player. The rigid body, uh, the big thing here is that we want this to be in the system, but we wanna be able to control it. That means the player needs to be kinematic. Okay, static is gonna to be totally stationary. Those are your options. We talked about this before. Kinematic means it's controlled by a script or animation, but it's in the physics system. Dynamic means it's just free. It's being simulated by the physics, right? And then static is just like your walls and your floors, things that don't move. And so the paddle is the only thing here that is kinematic, that we're gonna be controlling it, but it's in the system. And so your paddle needs to be kinematic. The player needs to have the player movement limits script on it. And so this allows us to control where the player can go, right? So this defines a box that allows the player to move left and right. And then we have a speed number to uh, adjust how fast the, the paddle goes when you press the buttons. So for instance, if we were to look at this now, I did move the walls as like a test here. But if I move the walls while I'm playing the game, this is how far I can move. This is how fast I move. If I turn up the speed, I think this should update immediately. Let's put the click back in here. Yeah, 20. Now my paddle moves twice as fast, right? And then these are the limitations. And so notice that the um, X and, mm, the, certainly the X, you would almost certainly want to be symmetrical, right? The game setup's at zeros in the middle. And so if this was uh, negative two and two, let's see here, negative two, and two, there we go, put a click back in here. Now, I can only go that far across. Everybody with me there? Understand how that works? Remember, I did all those changes in play mode. I go out of play mode, and they revert back. So if you want to make permanent changes, you need to go, yes. Uh, okay, well, you have to show me here. I mean, that's just not how it works. Like, the, if you changed an asset, but we're not really doing a whole lot of that yet. Can you open up the file where that's happening? So the player, and then here's the other thing, polygon collider. This allows us to edit the shape, and so you're gonna need to adjust this once you bring in a sprite for your paddle. Everybody with me there? So in here, let's look at what I did. I'll go to Edit Collider. The white bar is the shape of the paddle right now, but the green box is the shape of the collider. See what I did there? Why did I do this?
Exactly, right? This, by angling the collider slightly, it allows me to have some control over what direction the ball goes, right? Not complete control, but at least if I, I, if I hit the ball on the left side, I can kind of bounce it back to the left. If I hit the ball on the right side, I can bounce it back to the right. The amount of control you would have, you could influence by adjusting. Now, obviously, if you wanted it to be extreme, you would probably want to change the visual design of your paddle to represent that, so that's not completely misaligned with the, the shape. But this sort of very marginal uh, change here, uh, I think works, it's fine, that it doesn't completely represent it. But the polygon collider allows me to get in here and actually shape this so that I can choose how this works. When you use the polygon collider, if you just uh, click, it'll give you another node that you could use to uh, reshape it. And so for instance, I could do this by uh, something like this, right? So now, if I want, this would give the player, you know, very much more control, is that if I hit it over here, it would be a little bit of a uh, change in angle. If I hit it on the side, it would be an extreme change in angle. Those three things there, cool. Okay, so that's the player. Let's look at the ball. Okay, the ball has got the circle collider, as you would expect. You're gonna need to come up with a new ball sprite, and that's gonna go in here, right, into the sprite renderer. Um, the ball is dynamic, right, because it's the one bouncing around everywhere. And the big, the script that does the heavy lifting here is this one, breakout game manager ball script. So this uh, is essentially the heart of the game here. This is what uh, does most of the functionality is, is dumped in there. And so let's go through these parameters one at a time. Initial ball velocity. And so when the ball restarts here after, at the beginning of the game or after uh, losing, this is going to be the direction and magnitude of the ball thrust, initial velocity. So here, x is going to be left right, y is going to be up down. And so if I hit play right now, if I make it uh, so it's 0x and 500y, the ball should go straight up at the beginning of the game. However, that tends to maybe not be super interesting. There it goes. It goes straight up, and now it doesn't get any angle, angular velocity introduced until I make contact with the ball, because I've got that angled collider on the paddle. Um, and so here, by giving some sort of angular velocity, and then this is the up and down velocity of the ball, Here's a big one. Circle this in big letters in your notes. Ball speed, okay? This is probably one of the primary parameters that you're gonna wanna adjust to adjust the difficulty of your game. Again, we want people to play the game for three minutes, right? Can, they, can the average player play the game for three minutes on one set of three lives, right? And so this is gonna be one of the major things that you can dial up or dial down to sort of change that, um, that thing. Uh, starting push delay, this is how much time in seconds before the ball starts, after you lose or before you start. Uh, the lose barrier, this is the thing that defines uh, the area that gets hit, that makes you lose the game. This could be colored or not. The lose barrier is here, and you see that it has a collider on it. And allow me to draw your attention to this. When something triggers function 
in the game, then um, it needs to be set is trigger. So the lose barrier is a trigger. It doesn't bounce off the lose barrier. So notice that the lose barrier does not have a rigid body because it doesn't need to simulate any movement, but it does have the is trigger checked. Everybody with me there? That's a big one. So regardless of what you do with the walls and everything, the lose barrier, right, um, which can be moved up or down, and you could still have it function. How would I make it so that it's not visually seen, but still function? What could I turn off? You've got two choices. If I turn off the box collider, will it still function in the game? No. If I turn off the sprite renderer, will it still function in the game? Yes, exactly, right? And so this is a design choice you could make. Okay, I don't want to see that, but I want to still have a function. I do, I'm not turning off the object, because that would also make it not work in the game. Uh, I'm turning off the renderer. Right, this is a way to make an object still function, but be invisible. Yeah, you could actually just delete the sprite renderer as well. That would also do it. But in this case, I'm not going to do that because I you know, want to have it there in case you know, I need it later or whatever. It's not going to be the, any uh, overhead in the function of the game. And so if I hit play now, I should still be able to lose when it hits the lose barrier. But I don't have that red bar across the bottom. I put that in there just to sort of make it clear in the template. It's easier to understand things when they're visible rather than when they're invisible. OK, going through this script, because again, this is the most important one. Um, we talked about the number of seconds. The lose barrier right, is defined by the object. And so the lose barrier needs to be provided in this field. We've done this before with other scripts. Um, we're not going to worry about the UI right now, but these are going to be slots for turning on and off different elements in our user interface and our uh, music so that uh, those can interact with the game as it progresses. Everybody with me there? So we're not going to be filling those in this week. Um, we have a slot for the impact sound. So this is what the sound that uh, happens when it makes contact, not with a brick, because a brick will be able to put a different sound in, but just when the ball makes contact. Which is a big part of these kind of games. The, the hearing the impacts allows you to, um, gives you a lot more feedback about uh, what's going on. And now, do, 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 do. we have the number of points you get for a brick and the number of lives you have in the game. So again, this could be another, another like super low-hanging fruit. Is everybody familiar with that expression, pick the low-hanging fruit, right? It's not always about doing the super difficult things, it's about well, just do the easy things, all of those first, so that those are at least done. Um, so this is another low-hanging fruit, which you could use to extend the duration of the game, right? If you, got, if you start off with five lives instead of three, people would be able to play for longer. The, um, this is new. So write this down. Uh, up until now, we haven't dealt with tags. Tags allow you to make uh, groups of objects that um, the game can identify because of the group that they're in, right? You're tagging them. Up until now, we haven't really used this in Unity. Okay, so tags are the way that you can put things together. And you do this with a tag. And here, it says, what is the brick tag? And so the way that this game functions is that everything that is destructible, anything that is destructible that you get points for is, needs to have the brick, not brack, brick tag. 
Okay, so my walls do not have a brick tag. This permanent obstacle, this permanent obstacle, this permanent obstacle, those do not have brick tags. Okay, only the things that are destructible that you get points for have the brick tags. And so if I look at this brick right here, um, notice at the top, this is where you control the tags, up here where it says tag. Everybody see that? And so you can drop down and choose a tag. Because you're using the template, the tag brick will still be there. And so you can choose that. As you make your own bricks and your own destructible objects, this will be the tag that you need to need to add to it so that it becomes a destructible object that the game counts. Because the way that it works is that when you start the game, Unity looks at all the game's objects in the game and says like, okay, how many are labeled brick? And then it comes up with a number. It's like, okay, well there's 50 bricks. And so it starts counting down. And every time you destroy a brick, it's like, are there any more bricks left? Is there, any, is there anything left in the game labeled brick that's still on? And once, you, once it's able to answer no, you got all the bricks, then it satisfies the win uh, conditions. And so that's the primary thing to um, you know, define the bricks. And so in the main game manager script here, there is the tag. And so this needs to match the tag that you're using. So use the tag I set up, right? In, 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 you know, my point to you here is, don't change this, right? Um, there's no reason to. Uh, but be aware that the bricks need to have the brick tag. Everybody with me there? Okay. And as we go through the rest of this, the other part of it is, yeah, number of points you get for destroying a brick. And the last thing here is that since our ball plays a sound every time it hits something, uh, it needs to have an audio source on there. All right, so we talked about the ball, we talked about the player, we talked about the walls and the lose barrier. What else is here? Let's talk about the bricks. What defines a brick in the game? It needs to be labeled brick. It needs to be at z equals zero, like everything else in our game. It needs to um, have the sprite renderer. It needs to have a box collider, or just any collider, right? We talked about this, using different shapes um, in the game will be something you can do to control difficulty. And um, this is the thing that makes a brick a brick is the destroy on collision script. And so this, everything that gets collided with that you destroy needs to have this. And here you need to tell it what is the thing that's gonna destroy? It's the ball. Not when I hit other stuff, but when I hit the ball. Here, hit points. This is how many times you need to hit the brick before it gets destroyed. And so to make more difficult bricks, you would need to up this number. And so this, we're talking about this brick right here. And we'll see if I can play the game this well. And in order to test this out, I am going to cheat and go to the ball and slow down the ball. So let's make it uh, five so that I can demonstrate this with this brick right there. Go back to the brick. And so if I... Um, or actually, there's one in the game already. This brick up here, let's move it so that it's easier to hit. This brick has a different color, and it has two hit points. And so now if I were to start, I believe the ball is still going straight up. Mm -hmm. 
There it goes. It hits the yellow one. And the yellow one does not get destroyed. The blue one did get destroyed right away. And so, oh, missed that one. Uh, here, boom. Second time, destroys the yellow brick, right? And so you can dial that up as high as you want in order to make some bricks more difficult to destroy. Also, one of the things we can do to let people know that things are different in the game, before we were talking only about visual differences, right? Where we desaturated, we blurred, all those kind of things. Other things you can do with sound. And so this is a different sound that you can have when the ball hits a destructible thing. This is another way you can communicate to the player that, hey, this is a destructible thing and not just a wall, right? Uh, by having a different audio source. And then um, because there's a different audio clip, you need to have a audio source on the bricks so that they can play their sound. And so that's all, that's the anatomy of a brick there. Cool. And let's look at, uh, this one here. So the, I've got a couple different obstacles here, things that are not destructible, but somehow make the game more interesting. And two easy ways to do this here were um, this spinning obstacle, right? The spinning obstacle, uh, more of these would make the game definitely more difficult, right? Because it would be um, something that uh, makes it really difficult to know what angle the ball is going to come off at, right? And so how does this spinning obstacle work? The obstacle is not destructible, so it is untagged, right? It's not something I can destroy. The, uh, it is being controlled by a script, and so it needs to be kinematic. Everybody understanding the difference between these things? Dynamic, kinematic, and static? Basically, anytime something is controlled by a script or by uh, an animation, then it needs to be kinematic. Uh, it has the box collider. It is not a trigger, right? Because when something is a trigger, that means that things will not bounce off of it. It's more of like a zone, and you're testing the zone. The trigger is the thing that does that. And so by making it not a trigger, it is something I can bounce off of. And then here, this is the script that is controlling its rotation. And so this is a really simple script that's in the game. And you can use this for everything we do going forward that allows you just to slowly rotate objects, right? Um, this, uh, ver if you just want something to spin at a constant rate, you can do it with an animation, right? We did it with an animation in the playground. But um, it's kind of overkill in that you need to set a new animation clip every time. And so this makes that a little bit easier. And you can animate, uh, you can rotate in the x, y, or z direction. And this is the speed at which the animation happens. And whether or not you want to have the animation be randomized a little bit. right? And so if this was 0, there would be no difference between this one and this one. But since there are, when I hit play, you'll notice that they both spin at slightly different speeds. Right? Two of them are slightly different. Again, this makes it more difficult. If I were to take both of the spinning obstacles, this one, where's the other one? I don't know why I didn't label that. So let's label this one spinning obstacle, spinning Oh, there we go. Um, if I were to come in here and on both of these turn the random percentage down to zero, then they should both spin exactly the same. Let's see.
Did I change them both? Let's look. Zero. Oh, they have different numbers. 40 and 60. Let's make them both 60. There we go. And now they should be exactly the same. Yeah, exactly the same, right? Now, even though they're both 60, if I turn up the percentage of randomness, they should be slightly different, even with the same number. Make sense as to how that works there? In this 2D game, uh, pretty much any time you use this, you're going to be using Z rotation. Right? Z is the one that's coming out towards the camera. That's the one we're going to rotate around. We're not going to want to be rotating around the X or Y because that's going to make our sprite look like it's you know, like flipping in on itself. It's not going to look right. So some sort of obstacle here. The other obstacle I have is more of this pinball bumper looking obstacle here. And let's look at how that one works. Whenever it gets hit, it, first of all, it's circular, which we decided is like a more difficult shape, or it introduces more difficulty into the game in that it's hard, harder to forecast how the ball might bounce off of these things. And then what's happening every time the ball makes contact? With the bumper. Yeah, watch, it makes a, it changes its scale, it bounces around, there we go. See what's going on there? In this case, it is playing an animation. And so if we look at the bumper obstacle, under bumper, uh, again, kinematic, not tagged as a brick because it's not destructible. And it has the circle collider. And it has the script here that's doing the magic animation collision. What does this do? It plays the animation um, when something hits it. In this case, the only thing that's moving around is our ball. And so that does the, does the job for us. And so if we look at this window, let's go to animation. And let's look at the animator window. I just have the one animation in there. So very simple. And this one just gets played anytime it makes contact with the ball. And so to have an animated obstacle here, it would need to have the animator on it and the animation collision script. The only parameter for the animation collision script is that you need to tell it what animation clip do I play when I make contact with something. And so in this case, it is the scale up impact animation I made.
Okay, so we're going to do this one. Uh, well, this this will be due Monday, and then Monday we'll add our next level of polish to it. Um, but if you can have, uh, there's two parts of this. We're kind of smushing all the design into one week here. And so the sooner that you can come up with some sketch ideas about your game, post them on Slack, the better. And so the, here we go. I want you to come up with three, how did I, how, what do I do to keep closing Slack here? All right. um, three different designs and sketches for the game. Um, and again, organized around some sort of theme. I've given you some possible themes here. These are possible, right? So fruit, forest, computer, desert, or preferably think of your own ideas, right? What would be a you know, simple sort of theme you could use to inspire the visual design of all the sprites for your game? Everybody with me there? Along this line, I encourage you, for all of your portfolio projects, for the most part, to not use existing intellectual property. I think it just doesn't look great in a portfolio, right? Uh, this does a few things. It shows that, A, you're a person capable of coming up with their own ideas, and then, B, it also avoids having additional issues posting stuff online, right? If your portfolio is all Pokemon-themed stuff, it's going to be hard to get non-Pokemon uh, jobs. See what I'm saying here? So um, stay away from that in this project, right? If you want to come create your own character, and somehow that's a theme in the game, like, cool. Um, but don't use existing intellectual property. Everybody clear with me there and there, that, that idea? And uh, as you're sketching these out, right? Not sketching them out in Unity, right? Just real pencil, paper, like think about the brick arrangements because about the kind of things you're going to need to have in the game. You're going to need to have a paddle design. You're going to need to have a background design. Let's amend this here. Bricks, you're going to need to at least have five different visual designs for the bricks. Remember, we're using the word brick, but does not have to be brick shaped. We just talked about this, right? How the shape of the bricks is one of the things you can use in your possibility space as a designer. You're going to need to have moving obstacles. No, oh, all right, wrote background. There we go. Background walls. Right? So all these things need to be in your preliminary sketch. The closer you can get these done and I mean, you're going to include them in this project for next Monday. But the sooner you can get this part done and throw them up on Slack so that you can get some feedback from everybody and be like, yeah, I think your fruit idea was good. Your trash idea seemed kind of lame. Although now that I think about it, like, trash. Like, like three. It says that right in the directions. Because um, you're, you're not going to make all three you're going to make one. But we're going to come up with three different ideas and pick the best one. Right? This is part of being a designer. You've got good ideas and you've got bad ideas. Often, you need other people's input to help guide those decisions as far as like, um, which one of these is, is best? Yeah, so three. Um, the pop, 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 pop. is that, yeah, in the design, 
in your sketch thinking about these things. Like what, what are they going to look like? They don't have to look like bricks. Um, and then this, in addition to all the other stuff, when we get into actual the interactivity of it, right? What, how are you adjusting all of these different things to hit our target? And we'll say our target this time. Three minutes of gameplay, right? So that the games are not, the, the game is not so difficult that no one can play it for longer than 30 seconds, but it's not so easy that people are able to just keep going. Make sense? And so when you comment on everyone else's um, game ideas, uh, vote. I think this one was the best. I think that one, I think you should go with this one, right? And why, right? You think it has more potential. You think it could be visually more interesting, right? Make sense? The other part that I want to draw your attention to here is, let's open up, the other one is slightly different because I put something else in there. Let's go to the scenes. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll save that here. There we go. Um, is, especially in terms of the background, uh, we play a lot of Tetris Effect at our house. You guys play Tetris Effect? Yeah, I mean, I think it's demonstrably. I mean, the original Tetris, uh, obviously groundbreaking. But Tetris Effect, the audio-visual design in Tetris Effect, just total, totally top shelf. Um, let's look here. I linked to a couple things. So this is a GDC. You guys know what GDC is? Game Designers Conference. Happens every spring in San Francisco. I think I'm going to go this year. My travel funds, that'll be super fun. Um, but when you're looking for really the best thought out presentations on video game design, uh, I think all, maybe not all, but like many previous uh, GDC talks are just available on their YouTube channel. If you're not following their YouTube channel, like do it. Um, just lots of really interesting stuff. Anyway, so this is the one from Tetris Effect where they talk about the design of the game. Let me see here. I think there's a trailer here. In that Tetris, the, we're not making a Tetris game, but the, one, the thing I want to point your attention at here with this one is that Tetris is this, uh, you know, in the original incarnation, is a two-dimensional game, right? You got your blocks, you're fitting them into the, Everyone knows how this game works, right? Uh, and Tetris Effect is essentially the same game. There's a few other, you know, gameplay elements stacked on top of it, but it, it, by far and away, it's Tetris, just Tetris. Um, however, the game, the 2D game unfolds here in this play area, and you're surrounded as if the 2D game is taking place in this three-dimensional world. Uh, the audio-visual reactions that are happening in the... 3D world in this game are what really um, takes it to the next level. Let's see here. I think the trailer's here. Two, one. There we go. Um, let's turn up a little bit. The brainchild of Tetsuya Mizuguchi, the mom. Locks. This narrativity, you start seeing days of sleep experience where the music and background actually transform so, as you play you know you're playing the game and then there's these things folding out you know unfolding around you while the game is happening 
and they change from level to level. The primary takeaway, an important thing here, if you haven't played this, like by all means, just if you can, try it out. Um, the thing I think that we could apply to Breakout is that again, we have a primarily two-dimensional game, right? Or completely two-dimensional in our implementation of it. However, the background and the surrounding area, we have some 3D design skills now, could be three-dimensional. Unity allows us to do this, right? Where we can have meshes and sprites live in the same project, no problem. And so this, um, let me see, my favorite level, I'm a big Gamelon person, which is the Southeast Asian sort of metallophone orchestra. And there's a Gamelon level in Tetris Effect. Let me see if I can just find that. It's my favorite one. So the background, you know, it's like a three-dimensional thing, but then also, uh, you know, there's definitely some particle stuff effect happening here that's linked to the gameplay. When you hit Tetris, we shift to a new zone, and the animations change in the background. Um, and so there's this link between what's happening in the foreground and what's happening in the background. But the background is carefully... This one's pretty cool. It's like these two energy balls, but um, you know, so there's this top level synchronization that's happening between the foreground and the background. But then there's also um, the game is happening with music the entire time, and there's a, a a linking up of the gameplay events with the beat of the music. You know, sort of like a rhythm game element to it, which is uh, also just totally great. Super, super well done. Um, so here is while, while you're doing your game design, something that you can think about is that I've sort of in the template provided an example of like, how could I have a 3D background in my 2D design, right? We're not going to redo the whole game in 3D, but we could have 3D stuff in the background. So for instance, um, if I were to... Uh, turn this on. There we go. I've got just some cubes here, right? And nothing fancy. This is all stuff you guys know how to do. There's a directional light, and there's some cubes here. I use that same script, linear rotation, to rotate these cubes. Um, let's go ahead and change the speeds a little bit to something small because it's background, right? And so should these rotation values be high or low? Low, right? This is background stuff. I don't want it spinning around like crazy to distract you from what you're trying to do, right? And so let's move these down a little bit, but have them be different, so they're slightly different things. And so now, you know, there's the background. I could build a background in 3D, just like you built a whole scene in 3D already over the past two weeks that could exist in the background of the game when it loads right now. There we go. Right, so still, the uh, speed of everything here in the background is too, too fast. The, you know, rotation of the whole world could be changing. Obviously, don't want things to move in front of what's going on. But I've got all this space here, right? So the space you use to design the game, you're going to have because of this, you're probably going to end up with space over here and over here based on you know, how screens are. Most of the screens are going to be 16 by 9. So this gives you a lot of space to put your theme design, right? There could be stuff over here, like this 3D things happening, all sorts of other stuff. But you know, this 3D stuff happens now, and it doesn't affect the gameplay at all because it's all just 
none of this stuff has any colliders or stuff on it. Uh, and so the ball's not going to bounce off of any of these things. But it does allow you to introduce a level of dimensionality into the game, which uh, would not otherwise be possible. Right? So I'm not saying you have to have a 3D background. I'm saying this is something that's not too difficult to do. Right? When you think about what skills you have right now, for instance, if you picked fruit as your theme, you guys have enough skill as 3D designers yet, you know, right now to make some fruit with a volume builder, right? Pretty easy. And so you could have, you know, three-dimensional fruit floating around over here doing their thing. Make sense? And so that's my primary goal here today is that I want you to now think about the possibility space. We've kind of defined the possibility space as far as like, what's possible here? What can we do? Where, what, what constraints do I have to work against? And we've defined them. And now when you come up with your ideas away from the computer, think about those, how you would implement those ideas in the given possibility space for this project. Sound good? You got your wheels turning? You guys thinking about some possible themes? Diana, you got any ideas? Yeah, so when you're thinking about your ideas, you mean you're thinking primarily within the visual element, right? So the idea about the bricks also ending the game, that implies a whole bunch of more functionality, right? Which is not what we're doing, right? So when you guys would work in a game studio here, right, there'd be other people obviously doing all the programming, right? And so you have to work within your sphere based on what you have here. So minus the brick idea moving down, like that all sounds good. Rin, you got any ideas? What are they? What's one? <laughs> Dark colors? All at once? Mm -hmm. For any particular reason? Yeah. Just to see if I can do it without having everything be muddled. Everything be what? Muddled. Okay. So there, I mean, there's a contrast issue yeah. there. Yeah, so th that doesn't strike me as a great idea, right? Because contrast is one of the primary things that we need to control here, right? And to make the game playable, there needs to be some sort of contrast. I mean, the background design could be dark, but you still want the gameplay elements to be easily seen. I mean, in all my classes, this is something we'll do here. We'll put a volume in it maybe next week. Is that um, when you take the color out of your image, is there enough contrast that it's still readable? You know, in fashion, this is done with the silhouette. I should really memorize how to spell that word. I think I got close. That? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's going to take some work. Anyways, it's French. Right? Um, the silhouette, every fashion design goes through this, where just the out, bl dark outline of the shape needs to work before you see the colors, before you see the fabric, before you see everything else. Right? 
And so contrast is going to be a big, big part of that. Jose, you got any theme ideas? I mean, we talked about that a little bit. Maybe if you had one or two fish bricks, that would be OK. Making them all look like a thing just ends up looking a little corny sometimes. OK, I think there's some, there's some potential there. Certainly like an undersea theme, yeah. right? That would, there's a lot to go with there. But you know, thinking about it, you've got to balance the visual display with the functionality of the game. That's your job, right, with both of these things, where it's got to look good, but it also needs to work as an interactive experience. So maybe, right? There's some sort of underwater element to the destructible design, but the shark part of it maybe is a background element. You know, the shark swims by every once in a while. Versus, you know, the shark shape is going to be particularly irregular. What's that? Oil cans? Yeah. Okay, that would be. That, I think you're onto something there. Cool. Okay, so sketches ASAP, and then uh, our first iteration is going to be on Monday. Everybody, pretty clear about where? I mean, all, all the stuff is up there on the project. Let me make sure the project is published. Yeah, when you're working, I would put on that GDC talk from the Tetris Effect people. It's pretty, that's a pretty good one. Cool. All right. Any questions from you guys online? Brecken, Nick? I think they're good. They're a little bit further behind now. Okay, that's good. We will call it.